Good morning, good evening, Jeremy. How are you doing? Welcome to Lunch and Learn. All right, Jamie, we're going to have a few more minutes to get here, but uh, while we're waiting on everybody, do you have any questions? Okay, well, thanks for attending anyway. It's good knowledge sharing and a good opportunity to learn what's going on here at Decisions. So uh, I don't know if you know this, but, you know, we always have things going on at decisions um, we have end of life support so just to make sure you're aware of that that you know what our end of life support schedule is there you can work with the process manager on that and then of course we have our product roadmap it's ever bi-weekly it's every two weeks we also have a couple of events planned um, one in denver colorado coming up in April, in august and one in sydney australia in august so also always check out our events page for you know events training events or it could be webinars we might have Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to Decisions Lunch and Learn. It looks to be a lot attended Lunch and Learn today. So uh, VT, do you have any questions you would like to get answered?
So just to repeat, you know, make sure you're working with the custom manager on your end of life support. And then also our next, next product roadmap is June 29th. They happen to be right before this meeting. Okay, we got a question. The HTML to PDF step has failed with this message. Format of font symbol is not supported for new composite fonts. Any idea? Okay, let me dive into the actual application here. Give me one moment. So let's do HTML to PDF. So you're trying to do, you're trying to pass HTML to a PDF step. And you're saying it's given, you know, can, the format font symbol is not actually supported there. Okay. Have you, let me see, without having a copy of HTML, I'm going to have to do something a little differently. Let's see what fonts do I see. I only, I only support those fonts that I have here. So we need to do a font of symbol. I want to create a support ticket on that. Because as you can see right here, these are the fonts that we support. Maybe it's something that needs to be added to your environment as a font that's been installed, or I can look at adding fonts in decisions. But that's probably what's causing the problem is that the library is not supporting that, that we're using to create the font. Does that answer your question, VT? So I'm assuming you're using some special font in the HTML. All right. Next question would be Jeremy. How to set a user to always Chrome equals small? Okay. Sorry. Let me get back to VTs. It's not a font because it just handed randomly. So working with some documents that has the exact same styles. Without seeing your HTML and looking at the HTML going into the PDF, there's not much else I could do. You could probably share it to our support team because without seeing that exact HTML and reproducing the error, then I could troubleshoot it from there. I'm sorry, unfortunately. That's all I can do because without looking at the HTML and seeing the code you're sending in there, I really put in there. Sorry about that. So, how to set a user to be all in Chrome equals small. Are you trying to do it for the group or for just one specific user? Joseph? Um, for the group. Okay. So when you go into system and you go into your groups, and then right here I have, you know, let's just say my business rule authors group. When I edit the group, default, what you do is you put that parameter right here as default URL parameters, Chrome equals small right here in this, and that will make it where it's always Chrome equals small. Can they override that? They can go in the URL and override it, of course. Yeah, is there a way to somehow not let that happen? Mm. There's, like in portal settings, there's a, you know, hide the folder bar, but that kind of like to like hide the folders in the folder bar. Yeah. But that goes across the whole system, mm -hmm. like even in studio. Um, yeah. So what are you trying to accomplish? You're just trying to hide the folder tree? Yeah, just trying to, I, I, I don't want, the, yeah, the folder tree. 
in the portal view uh, mm-hmm. and then preferably that little white little bar you know set culture set language um, mm-hmm. at the top one yeah just because there's really all interaction should be on the page itself not on not on the... yeah okay so chrome small does at least hides the folder thing uh, and I don't know if you know this one too. Chrome equal off. That hides everything except the page. Mm-hmm. But they could always as yeah, you see right like here. The header though. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, these two right here, I can. There's ways, like you said, to hide a folder tree, or to hide this bar from the users, but the set culture and set language, that's the one I don't know if we have ability to hide from the standpoint of, of everybody. So let's go into settings. Let's go to portal settings. BT said the- You can change, the you can edit these. So you can mm-hmm. go into the folder view tree. That's it. That's a report. I need the other one. Let's see. Use culture format extensions. You can, you know, show folder, show recent. But this applies to both. Uh-huh. That's the problem. All right. Yeah, I guess just the the default one on the group helps, and then mm-hmm. uh, like that one said on. Um, some sort of Java control. I don't really know how to do that, but I'm... You can hide the title bar. Hide title bar. Like you can say, I want to hide the title bar in the base when that hides the bar. So that at least hide that. This is my local host, so it's not a big deal. So you can at least hide that. You can hide this. But the folder tree, the only thing I can think of to do is that portal settings Mm -hmm. and then uh have that well i appreciate it okay uh this is a sport ticket in you know i would see why that would happen Thank you. All right. Next question to answer. Uh, I think, Carrie, did you, let's see. Create a JS control, listen off. Yeah. Because that's the problem is that we can't control what they actually put in the browser window because they can always go they can change the same the browser window because we don't control what actually goes in the browser url but it created a support ticket and i'm sure somebody's dealt with this before hello carrie how are you doing today i think you had a pre-submitted question so you're trying to you're running a form and created an edit and copy button for each item in the In a, in a sub form repeater, when I click on the edit, it takes me to the pop up window to edit, but I cannot. Thank you, Sabrina, for putting in the chat. It takes it to a pop up window to edit, but I cannot return to the main browser window once I save my edit. I cannot refresh the edit. So, if you don't mind, I went ahead and built some of this out. Awesome. And let me just go to my lunch and learn today. So inside of this form,
right here is it now i'm going to ask you when you say that you have edit and copy of each item in the subform repeater is this what you mean you have a data repeater on a form right i have a data repeater on the form and then as part of the record in the form i used an edit and copy image button within each row mm -hmm. so you have another you have a button here So you have a sub dialog button, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. Yep. That you just create new update. I'm going to keep this very generic update data. Sure. And then right here, you have another form that just says. Sorry, I'm, these will be very, very simple forms. I'm sorry. No, that's OK. <laughs> So I'm just going to drag a button over here and call this close. Show and call this update. And I'm going to have the button called closed. And then I'll just say new name. So right here I have new name. Now I could pass this on, but I'm going to ignore this input. Now in the close, it just goes to cancel and update. You would need to do the actual update function. So I'm going to do a, this is user defined type I've already created. It's called parent. And I'm going to do a select, I'm going to do an update. I'm going to do a selective update for this entity. And then right here, I'm simply going to, you know, update the name of it. New name, and I'm going to pull in the ID. Of course, I got to pass the ID from the data repeater. So I need to form data. Would I be able to have access to this video for this? After? Yeah, absolutely. Because this is great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh -huh. So I need to be able to pass the ID in there so I can pass the ID down here because I need the ID of my entity. And then I have my change data step. Now this is a very, can, you can do other things to do this, but let's just save this. And now in my, now right here, you see my input data, I need the ID. And the ID is going to be, you know, form input data. And it's going to be the actual current item. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. And now I'm going to actually go back into this flow. And that should be ID. Perfect. Okay. So this is update. And the delete flow should follow the same function. Except instead of being update, it'll be delete. Okay, so this is what the, you're doing right here. And I'm gonna save this. Now, what I am gonna do is I don't think I have anything in my parent. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and just create a flow and call this create data. Now I'm gonna be lazy and call this parent thing. And I'm going to go down to my user defined types. I'm going to go down to my entity, and it is actually, I call it parent. So just create this parent. And I'm going to say build my data. And all thing I'm doing right here is just making sure I have something in there that I actually can do. And folder ID, constant. I'm going to call this my current folder. We debug this and call this carry. Uh, what did I leave out? Tyler. Name is required. Left the name filled out. Let's call it parent name too. 
Okay, so now I have, should have a parent in there. So now I've created my form. Now I'm gonna simply create a flow. That's gonna be my update data flow. See right here's my form. Data one, I'm gonna ignore for my list of values, I need to fetch them. So I'm gonna fetch my entities. I'm gonna be parent. Sorry if I'm moving too quickly, please let me know. I'm gonna try to get all this set up. That's okay, I'm following you generally. All right, you. okay, so what I've had to do, probably what you had to do, is you have to fetch the entities for your data list, correct? Yep. And then you put them into the form. So I'm gonna go ahead and debug this. And now right here, I have my carry, as you see right here. Mm -hmm. I'll update and call it new name and call it Tyler. Then you click update. Okay, what did that mess up? Value cannot be null. What did I put as values null? Okay, let's go in here. Where did I mess up? Mm -hmm. Problem about building stuff on the fly. You never know when you're going to mess up. <laughs> All right, let's go into this form. All right, let's go ahead and look, see what I'm, make sure I'm passing the correct information in here. Pass in my process name. Maybe I should do this a different way. So what I'm gonna do, now I'm gonna do something a little differently because I wanna make sure I get the correct ID. I'm gonna add a fetch entity step here. And the only thing I'm doing here is I'm fetching that parent again. So I'll make sure I have the correct ID in this subflow. So I don't know if it's being passed through properly. So I'm adding a second fetch step. Then we'll pass through the ID I'm going to call it ID, but the name of it. And then that will actually be able to put through the ID, which I'm going to edit. Because so I think that could be happening is you're, somehow the ID of that entity is not being passed in here. All right, so save this. Now let's go ahead and update data flow. And then update this and call it Tyler. Then update. So you need this to refresh. That's what's not happening. This data repeater is not refreshing. That's what's happening yeah. here. That's right. And I'm actually opening it through a, a browser window. I'm using like that API function. I don't know if that makes a difference, but in theory, it shouldn't, I wouldn't think. So I need to, I'm gonna try this. I'm gonna try something right here. I'm actually gonna put a refresh. So we need to refresh, force the refresh of the form. I'm gonna try something. See, it's, already, it's been updated, as you can see right here, it's updated to Tyler already, but we need mm -hmm. to find a way to refresh. Let's just call this, let's call this Sabrina now. No, pardon me. 
broke something else up. See, it's refresh. Oh, because. So it's updating. We got to figure a way how to update the form. Make the form actually update. Let me look at that subflow. So the data is getting updated, but the form is not getting updated. Yeah, I had a similar experience. I put a refresh button at the bottom, but it's not really the experience. I no, want. it's not the experience you want. So let's look at some other item. Okay. Because I know, are you on a page by chance or are you on a, is it just a form workflow you're kicking off from a process? I'm on a form workflow that I'm kicking off and I'm, you know, viewing it through the API browser session. Um, and so what I do is I, I have my list form, my repeater that opens up the edit window, very similar to what you've done there. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if I add a new item to the form, so like I've got an add new with button at the bottom yep. of, the, of the, the main parent form outside of the repeater. If I use that add new button, it opens it up in the browser window, not a pop-up window. I can fill out the new record and I hit save and it, I can have it take me back into that parent form with the repeater in it. And it does give me that updated new record at the bottom. It's mm -hmm. just the inter transaction. It's the row. update function, yeah. Yeah, that's the only part that I'm struggling with. Now, have you tried? I don't know if you want to allow this or not. And it's there's another function that we do have. Uh, have you tried using advanced data grids? No, I've not. Okay. So on data grids, it's a now because on the data grids, let me go ahead. I'm just gonna create a new form. Give me one second. So if you have an advanced data grid you can allow for inline edit where they can go and edit them in the line. Don't have to, you know, create a subflow and have another form pop up unless you need something tracked. So um, tell me about that a little bit more. The okay. record that I have is quite big. So like mm -hmm. it's an application page okay. basically. So there's a lot of records in it. Mm -hmm. And then on the repeater, I really just give the title of the record and the the status of it so that and then with the pencil icon for them to go in and ed edit the larger record with all of the different fields so would a data grid have to put all of the fields in can you show me the example you know i'm trying yeah. to create a minimal experience on the oh, nope. I, can, I completely agree okay. okay so right here so it creates a report top view so the advanced data grid, you know, you're going to the data repeater and having that. The, with this, you can actually go to the report and say, okay, which field do you want to show? Okay. And then when they edit, would they have to bring columns in and out or have to see the whole thing, I guess? Well, how do you, so you want them to be able to edit it and be able to kick up a process which has the entire record. Record. Let's just try it. Okay. Let's just try it because I'm going to go edit and I'm going to actually add in. I don't know. Have you ever used the the run flow inline field? I've not tried that. No. Okay. So within this, you can say you can actually add a. And then right here, you can run a flow based on this. So I'm going to create a new one, and I'm going to call this my update flow. Oh, 
Okay, and now with this, I can have a form. And I'm actually going to pick that same form. Going to be my update form. And with this, I'm going to ignore my new name. And now with my update, just like before, I'm going to do my my selective update on my entity. Now right here, I could, you know, have a new process name, which would be the new name. And then on my ID, right here, I have my selected row, which I can pass in that value of my ID. It's going to be four, I hope. Okay. Then we'll pass in my ID. Well, my ID, I'm actually going to hide it. So what I'm trying to do right here is create that sort of run flow flexibility right here for you. Now my advanced data grid, let me give it a name. We'll call this close. Just so I have a name for this and put data name as parent list. I can, you know, I can add a add a remove button to it here. Not put data name as list. So right now I'm just creating some very simple, you know, adding in the that. And now I'm gonna go create a flow. I'm actually just gonna update my data flow. And I'm actually going to change this form out to my new form. Form three. List of parents, any results. Now let's go ahead and debug this. Now I have my list of Sabrina. And now, you know, I have delete action here. But I should have edit and call this, let's say, Tyler. Oh, what did I mess up? Value cannot be null. But the target, I bet the. Give me one second. I would tell you, Carrie, I actually prefer using advanced data grids, a lot more than data repeaters. Gotcha. Oh, I still got it empty. Let me just do it this way. Do the same pattern I did earlier. And go ahead and do the fetch inside of here. So I'm going to fetch the parent. And I'm going to fetch it by process name. That should be selected row value one. This should be any results.
Okay, I gotta figure out what this area is, but this is the pattern I would use because it would allow you to create this type of work workflow and use the flow and use the reporting engine. Okay, this helps me. Yeah, yeah. and you get a little bit, bit of extra functionality with it, I guess. Yes, okay. because you get the reporting engine. And I just gotta figure out why the primary key is not being passed through into this. Okay, let's go ahead and just do it this way. So I'm gonna turn on the global debugger. Then I'm gonna go and do the update flow. See if I can see what is missing. Primary key field cannot be left entity. Yeah, I'm picking the wrong column. But see, it's the process name is actually the ID. So it's putting the ID in there. Okay. Uh, let me play with this, Carrie, and let me get back to you. There's something else I'm missing, very, very simple that I'm missing. Let's see what this says now. Okay. ID is null. It's pulled ID is null. Yeah. I mean, no pressure. I, I suspect there's a. Yep. There's definitely a way. And if you want to reach out to support, you're happy to reach out to support. That's the problem. Awesome. Though. All right. Thank you for your help. I appreciate this. Thank you, Carrie. Bye. Nice to talk to you again, by the way. Absolutely. So you need to change the response code on an API integration. Thanks to the support VT also. If you want to come on mute and talk about it, you absolutely can. Yeah, uh, I, uh, so I have a, a, a flow created and uh, we are exposing it as a, a API uh, mm -hmm. and uh, like while testing it through the postman, uh, we are getting the uh, response code as 200, uh, all those things, but we, we, we have requested uh, from, I mean, from our team, uh, we have requested to change the response codes, what we get from this, uh, in the uh, <clears throat> post. So is that possible uh, in decisions? To change the response code coming out yeah. the inset? Yeah. From 200 to something else? Yes. I don't think there's a way to change the response code because we use the standards. Uh, you can also, you can always pass out a custom response code 
but of course the 200 or 2500 the, the the 404 will all be there also i do not know of a way to i don't think i have any other panelists on the call that might know i do not know a way to uh we can do it through uh, uh through but that is like uh, only for the error error flows we can do it by using through uh, and give the response code whichever uh, required but i'm i'm also uh, talking about uh, the uh, uh like the successful uh, response code as well yeah so yeah that's where i'm that's where i'm as we can you know you can throw exceptions and be able to put that in your response but it's when it's you want to change the successful 200 code okay. on a completed transaction Let's see if i can do that I mean, but that means you're throwing an exception on every transaction, which you don't want to do either, because that's going to muddy up your records. Why have an exception on a good transaction? Uh, I do not know a way to do that. I would say, uh, I hate to keep saying this, send a ticket is to support. That same, is that same with the, the bad request and uh, or uh, forbidden uh, 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 response, something like that? Like for for those also, we can't we change uh, the response code? From when it gets inside the application, you, like if you wanted to change the response code in here, but mm -hmm. I don't know if authentication, because the authentication happens before the flow is executed. I don't know if we can change a 404 error because it actually happens before the flow is executed. It happens in the authentication layer. Okay. So that's something you have to bring up to support and we we'll have to get a dev involved to be able to look at the code and see, okay, where can we change and what we can't change. Unfortunately, that's a code level question, but happy to take that in support. Okay. okay, thank you. And also, like I have uh, one one more uh, question. Uh, so, like um, now we have a we have a client, and if we log in, we have a URL, and if we log in into that, uh, we, if we launch that URL and try to log in, uh, it it has a dedicated uh, SSO. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, it shows the uh, company name there and in, in that login page itself, uh, like uh, IDP and uh, like the other other uh, company name. So like if I if I want to uh, create a different login page for a other client, is that uh, possible to do uh, using the de decisions like whatever features we have in the studio? Like I, I would say like my multi-tenant. Can if you have decisions multi-tenant, each tenant can have a different IDP. So they can okay. have a different login method. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that is what I mean. uh, so you got throw API section. Thank you, VT. So you can throw an API exception and give a different status code. Hmm. So you can do this, you can, but you don't want to throw an API exception for a good transaction. And technically, you can throw an API exception, which gives you, you know, a, a status code you can customize. Hmm. The the only one I don't know if you can change is the 404 error because it's okay. an authentication error and it happens before the flow is executed. Yeah, this, this this I'm uh, aware of. Like this yeah. throw exception, I'm uh, aware of this. So I'm I'm uh, talking about this authorization response and the other one. Yeah. Yeah, it's the it's the four hundred four, the five hundred, the 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 exceptions that happen before the flow executes. That I don't. That's code level changes. I don't know if we can get that done or not. Okay. Uh, so the other one uh, about uh, multi-tenant. So, so can you uh, brief me about it? Like I'm, I'm not, uh, not, not, not. I don't have any knowledge on that. So if that that would help me. 
Yeah, so if you go on our documentation site, now you can, it's a special license for multi-tenancy. But if you need, you know, different login methods of IDP and different IDPs, you can either do it through a custom login page or you have to do it through multi-tenancy, which I'm going to go to documentation and look up multi. And then right here, multi-tenancy, right here is your multi-tenancy action directory set up in sync. But right here is our multi-tenancy guide. And I'm going to pass this into the Zoom chat. Okay. And this right here, now you got to work with your CrustS manager to make sure that you, you, know, you have access to that. But with this, it creates a different tenant of decisions. And that allows you to have different login page and different IDPs for those. Okay. But I would have definitely have a conversation with the process manager about that. Okay. Yeah. Okay, this will, uh, I'll, I'll go through this document and uh, try to uh, get some solution for this. Yep. If it's and not good, then maybe I'll, I'll uh, get back. And just to confirm on the integration details, you can you have to throw exception step, but the problem you won't have is if it's a 404 or 500, mm -hmm. those steps are pre flow that you know, 500, you know, servers down, 404, it's authentication error. Those are pre flow executed. So, those I don't know if we can change those or not. Okay. Okay. Yeah. These are all great questions. Yes. Yes. Is there, is there any more questions we have today? Um, no. Thank you. Okay. I need to add a converter flow to my project. I'm showing currency on a form, but the currency is shown with a BR in front of the, in front on the term. Okay. Let's look at that. Hello, Tyler. This is Daryl. Hey, Daryl. How are you doing? Doing well. Daryl, how are you, man? I'm good. Nice hey, it's Mark. You. Mark, how you yeah, doing? Yeah, man. I'm doing well. All right. So you have a form right here. Mm -hmm. And you have a currency box on it. Mm -hmm. And you are using the currency box, correct? Yeah, so I'm using a currency box on the form, and mm -hmm. um, when that, but when it's showing, it is showing uh, with a BR in front of it on the form. So this was a solution that I taken to support, and mm -hmm. so they helped me with another project. So yeah, uh, I'm trying to reduplicate what they did on that project, but I kind of got stuck. Okay, so two questions I've got for you. And call this money. Keep it simple. Uh, on the step, you can have the currency symbol and you can change it. Mm -hmm. So are you having, is it BR? Because it. Yes, it's showing, exactly. It's showing that BR in front of the premium. Uh -huh. So it's say premiums $1,500 and yeah. it'll show BR $1,500 instead yeah. of just showing $1,500. Okay. If the currency box always shows the currency. If you want to just sell fifteen hundred dollars and not show the currency box, uh, you have to use a normal number box or a decimal box. Okay. Because the currency box is just, has this little design where it always shows that, but you have the number box where you can determine, you know, and it just shows the number of flat out value. All right, I see what you're saying. Let me just take a look because I want to, mm -hmm. yeah, I'll take a look at that. I'm going to go into another project. Because if you have that, if you want to not show the currency, you have to use a normal number box. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know, and this may be a deeper conversation. I know we don't have a lot of time on the call, but I, I think what's happening is, because even on my other project, it was, we were showing it, I think, with a text box or some other number box, maybe a number box. And it was still showing the BR. And so one of the support guys was like, it's we were trying to map in currency 
Mm -hmm. premium and then you go one level deeper and get currency and he's like you can't do it that way you got to want a converter flow versus just mapping it directly okay um i just don't remember those steps of how he did that actually yeah absolutely so let's go ahead so on the money mm -hmm. like on the input you can run a converter flow mm -hmm. yep and you can on the converter flow let's just run converter you can create one yes and call this currency to number. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna we're gonna call this, you know, money. Mm -hmm. This will be a decimal. And on the output. Let's call this money. Okay. Because see, you're using the, the currency format. Mm -hmm. You should be able to use an unforded or default format too on the actual thing. And that should give you non-formatted data also. So oh, all right. So you should be able to, you know, you have currency here, default, or I would use default. Mm -hmm. And you know how many decimal places you want, no decimals with a separator, you have all flexibility to do that. Okay, all right, that may be an option to go that yeah. route. Yeah. Okay, all right. And do they want to change this or no? You mean change it into? Like, like a, a string value, does it need to be edible as a number or do you mm -hmm. care? No, okay. no, it's just going to be output as a number. So basically, we just it's like a insurance input form, quick yep. quote. Yep. And so we just need to show the premium on that form for whatever the data they input. Absolutely. I would just, you know, either run a converter flow or on the input, just keep it simple and just say select from flow. I want to look at, I'm just going to do it. Let's, let's do it money. Mm -hmm. oh, oops, helps I don't shut all my windows down. <laughs> Okay, so I have my money in here. Okay, all right, decimal. Okay, I'm good there. There's my money too. Decimal. And I want to make it a default value. I'm just leaving it decimal. Okay, what am I still screaming at? Oh, that's fine. Let's just make this 1500. And see right here, this one has that net dozen. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Yeah. Uh, I think I can do that. Thanks. I appreciate it. No problem. Mm -hmm. And you see right there, I didn't use a converter flaw. I just passed it in as the value I'm looking for. Yeah, use the number box. In, no, I oh, gotcha. Yep. I saw that. Well, thank you for a very great lunch and learn. And if there's no other questions, I'm happy to help everybody has a good weekend. Thanks, Tyler. Thank you. Thank you.